Signore e signore, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò, buonasera. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here for yet another adventure in Italian opera with Fred Plotkin. Um, as you know, my duty in this evening is telling you something new about Fred. I believe the last time I told you that Fred had just started his most impossible adventure, daring task, that was initiating me to Wagner. Well, he indeed started, and I give a partial report of my initiation, and you can find it online if you're interested at all, on La Voce di New York, and it's uh, You e Wagner, Una Storia d'Amore Impossibile, something along those lines, just to give you a sense. But I have to say that I was uh, fortunate enough to see uh, the last of the, no, the second of the four installments of my initiation at BAM uh, in HD, preceded by a lecture by Fred uh, about uh, the ring, the entire thing. And you know how he, he started? He said, first of all, I love Italian opera more than anything else. And knowing the Wagner fans, I thought that they would lynch him. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, of course, he charmed them all and, and the lecture was uh, actually absolutely amazing. Um, one more thing about Fred is that the New York Times just announced their next um, trip to Italy that includes opera and food and it's fantastic, and it's going to be in October and November, between October and November. It's going to be uh, Parma, Milan, Novara, Bergamo, and in each city they're going to see a different uh, opera. I take this opportunity to remind you that uh, Parma, the Verdi Festival in Parma that takes place in October when they will be there, just won the International Opera Award for Best Opera Festival um, last week in London. It was awarded last week. So it's a great trip. I believe they've already uh, given away 12 uh, um, spots. So if you're interested, take a look at the website of the New York Times. Tonight, it's going to be a very different format, as you can see from the setup on the stage, because we have the fortune of having a, a great singer who is also now a great teacher. So we're going to have the fortune of being part of one of her classes. And without further ado, please welcome Fred Lotkin and Loretta Di Franco. <laughs> And good evening to all of you. Um, it's a special night. It's always a special night when we do Italian opera here. I love Wagner too, but... <laughs> <laughs> and Strauss and Mozart especially. But there is nothing like Italian opera. And Loretta DeFranco had as a singer one of the longest careers in the history of the Metropolitan Opera. She sang 929 performances there. And <laughs> everything from working in a winery in Elisir de More to swimming in the Rhine River in Das Rheingold and being a child to Boris Goodenough, singing Mimi Musetta, many, many different roles. Many. And um, we're going to talk about that somewhat. But Loretta is also the Italian diction coach of the Metropolitan Opera, and I've wanted her to come for a couple of years. <coughs> we made this happen tonight because you hear me talk all the time about how diction, the use of language, improves and makes an operatic performance that much more interesting and meaningful than just singing notes and mouthing words. We arranged to have a singer, a soprano tonight, and a pianist, and last night, the soprano got in touch at midnight. My vocal cords, my tonsils, I have the flu, I can't sing. So tonight's guest, and you'll meet her later, soprano, jumped in today at about noon. And our pianist had to throw away the music we were going to do. And we're doing different music tonight, uh, all Italian, of course. And so I really want you to understand that this is going to be <coughs> something very special, unique. It's hard to put together a master class. We have the master teacher here, 
And so what we're going to be doing, I will be speaking to Loretta first for about a half hour, and then she and I will go in the audience, and the artists will come on the stage, and we will work with them as if it were a master class, because it is a master class. And then we'll have time at the end for a little more conversation and perhaps questions. So I would like to start right away welcoming Loretta DeFranco. I welcome all of you, and buonasera. Buonasera. It's a pleasure to be here and see so many faces, uh, and I hope you enjoy the evening. So Loretta began in the Met Chorus. That's right. And sang a couple of roles like, uh, I think you were a page in, Han in Tannhäuser, um, you were a peasant in Lenozzi di Figaro, you were an orphan in De Rosen Cavalier. You were a milliner in DeRosa Cavalier. These were the early roles. Um, but then the Met did a production of Tchaikovsky's Queen of Spades. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Russian opera was only done in English at the Met. And Loretta graduated from being in the chorus to being a solo performer in the role of Chloe. And I found a review from October 21st, 1965, Irving Culloden in the Saturday Review wrote, Loretta DeFranco, a former member of the Met Chorus, who was the auditions winner last spring, in other words, the Metropolitan Opera National Council, made her debut <coughs> in the suitably small role of Chloe in the second act pastoral. Hers is a lovely, pure soprano sound, and she uses it well. That's lovely. Yeah. I forgot that. Thank you. And that was 1965. Many years. <laughs> yeah. In other words, the old Metropolitan Opera House. And that's one of the things I'd like to ask you about, is memories of the old Met mm -hmm. as a theater, how it worked, how it functioned. They didn't have the same kind of room or space. I know they rehearsed in Sherry's restaurant. I'm going to move that, if we can, a little closer, closer. to you. Is so that, that we really hear you, yes. Is that better? Okay, you can hear me now? No. Closer. Is that better? Emilio? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let me just begin that. I started in, in the chorus in 1960 in the old house. And um, I, I was very young then, of course. <laughs> but. Uh, it was an amazing experience, and each year I auditioned for the National Council auditions. And finally, in uh, 1965, I was lucky to each year I, I graduated from the uh, first audition to the next one and moved up a little further. And in 1965, I got to the finals, and I won. <laughs> I won first prize, and with that came uh, $2,500 and a contract with the Met as a soloist. So needless to say, I was thrilled, excited, and uh, the Met, and I was very fortunate, the Met was my home. So when I was on stage doing the auditions, I, I didn't, re I mean, I was very nervous, of course, but I felt at home. And it wasn't as if I, you know, I haven't sung on the stage before, so. It, I felt relaxed, and I imagine for other singers coming from the world, well, throughout the States and in Canada, it must be uh, rather frightening to look out and see almost 4,000 people staring at you <laughs> and listening to you. But it was a, a wonderful experience, and it was the first time it had been done, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's how my, my solo career began. And at the auditions, you sang Caro Nome. I sang Caro Nome. Which last night's soprano was going to sing for you today, but we have great music today as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, now, you sang, I, when I did my research, I found that some of the conductors that you worked with at the very beginning of your career, the first one she worked with was George Schulte. Oh, wow. Then Eric Leinsdorf, Thomas Shippers, the best. George the Pret. How in the old house did conductors have influence and impact on performances? Because everything was much smaller. 
Uh, yeah. Y- yes, and uh, we we would have our rehearsals with the conductor on the uh, let's see what it was it what was it called the rooftop stage, mm-hmm. and um, it was you know to a young singer it was very uh, frightening, intimidating, but they would they were just delightful, and what a thrill for you know to work with such great conductors, and um, I was excited. And I learned from them. I'm like, <laughs> I was like a sponge trying to, to absorb everything I could. And uh, they were amazing. And, and sometimes, you know, we, as a youngster, you, you really become nervous and coarse. But also, it's sometimes intimidating because you're working with a world-famous conductor. And, uh, but they were gracious. And uh, sometimes you know, fr- uh, a little frightening, but they th- they were very supportive. And uh, I was f- I was fortunate. I think the stars seemed to come together <laughs> in the beginning. And I was fortunate to be there for so long. You work with Zubin Mehta, with Carl Berm. Oh, yes. Um, I, I do have to tell an Eric Leinsdorf story, even if it doesn't involve you. Okay. Um, <laughs> According to my research, you were not ever in a production of Zalame at the Met. No, that's no. correct. Um, but he was conducting at the old house a production of Zalame, conducting rehearsal. And um, there are characters known as the five Hebrews or the five Jews in Zalame. And he was <laughs> leading rehearsal, and he was coaching the singers who play the five Jews. And then he put down his baton in the orchestra pit, and he said, Okay, all the Jews can go home. <laughs> Half the orchestra got up and left. <laughs> True story. That's very funny. That's funny. That is funny. <laughs> it's tr- funny. true story. Um, and so you were there as the Met Metropolitan Opera Company transitioned to the new Met, moving yeah. from the old house on 39th and 7th Avenue up to Lincoln Center. And there's a very good documentary that came out a few months ago called The Opera House about that transition that I certainly recommend to you. It's a wonderful documentary, wonderful. And they did nine new productions in the first season, which was incredibly ambitious. (coughs) The world premiere of Samuel Barber and Minotti's Anthony and Cleopatra on the opening night. Mm -hmm. And then the next night, La Traviata. And you were in that as Anina. I was Anina, and I was in Magic Flute. You were in Magic Flute Um, and Die Frau und Schatten. Die Frau und Schatten. Yeah. Now, um, I wonder what it could have been like rehearsing simultaneously Die Frau und Schatten the Magic Flute and La Traviata, all in a period when they were trying to get this monumental Samson, I'm not Samson Delilah, Anthony and Cleopatra yeah. on the stage in a new theater. How, what, was it chaotic? Was it, it was very chaotic, especially uh, with the opening night of uh, Anthony and Cleopatra. The, uh, the set wasn't working. The, the revolving table collapsed <laughs> with the weight of so many people. And... Uh, the uh, stagehands had to come in and manually turn it, it around. And uh, uh, Leontine Price was in the triangle, along with Rosalind Elias. Mm. And that didn't open for a while. No. <laughs> so it was very exciting. There were a lot of <laughs> last minute changes, and uh, some additional music was added to, mm-hmm. the, to the opera. And, uh, but the show went on. The show must it always go indeed. on, right? So, and you were also, I went. As a, I was 11, not even, I was 10, to the opening night of Mark Chagall's Magic Flute. Oh, wow. And you were Papa Gaina oh, in that yes. with Ted Upman. And did you meet Chagall? Was he present? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, there was, a, we, there was a big reception for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, it was, it was amazing. He was amazing. And we, have, we still have, I believe, the, the, his paintings above the, uh, yeah. the bar at the Sherry's. Well, I call it Sherry's. I don't know if it's... Sherry's was the old Met restaurant, yeah, yeah. but... But, you know, anyway, it, yes, we, uh, he was a charming man, and yeah. uh, so, so 
gifted. I mean, the work he did. And he was from a town in, in the former Russia, Belarus, whatever, called Vitebsk. And my grandmother was from Vitebsk, oh. and she always said, my father's mother, that she was his first, first, let's put it that way. <laughs> and, um, and, and he used to draw me all the time. And did he give you those drawings, Grandma? Yeah. And what did you do with them? What did I know? I, I threw them away. Oh, wow. Uh. Wow. <laughs> and I asked him, I met him years later, and I said to him, do you remember Rose? Sure I do. I said, did you draw her? Sure I did. What was she wearing? <laughs> he just went like... <laughs> I don't want to know any more about Chagall and my grandmother, but he, he could have been my grandpa had things been different. Uh, That's funny. <laughs> but you did a lot of Italian language opera. Um, I noticed one thing that I didn't know that <coughs> you sang with Beverly Sills in her first Met performance, which was not at the Metropolitan Opera House. It was in 1966 in the summer in Lewison Stadium. You sang Zerlina in oh, Don Giovanni, right. and she sang Donna Anna. And Justino Diaz was Don Giovanni, and Fernando Correno was Leporello. And Beverly Sills got to the Met relatively late in her career, sort of the early 70s, and I had no idea that she sang in 66, which was the year of her great success in, in Handel's Giulio Cesare. Um, the Met used to basically tour. I saw that you sang with them in Paris. You went out on the road. What was yeah. the Met tour like? Well, uh, the first tour that I went on, we, we, would, we traveled by... Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Oh, it's going to fall over. Okay. Grazie. Va benone? Si. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Um, the Met tours were fascinating because the first time uh, I went on tour, it w we traveled by train. And um, a lot of the uh, singers, some of the male singers, would go to the club car and play cards, cards. most of the night. And um, it was fun. It was, it, was, it was actually a little tiring because you'd have all these little stops in between and uh, those little little sleeping cars that were not the most comfortable. But it was, it was different. It was something new and exciting to me. Um, but uh, after a while, we flew. <laughs> and then we, we took, uh, I'm jumping over years, but my favorite uh, trip was when we went to Japan. And uh, that was very exciting. One instance, um, I was covering Mimi. And uh, we, we were performing in two different theaters. One was, and they were both on the other side of town, totally opposite. Now, I was, I was so nervous because I could speak Italian, some German, and some French. Couldn't speak Japanese. <laughs> Not a word. Unless oh, you could say Ohio, right? Or whatever. <laughs> but this night, I, I decided... I was at the, at the hotel, then I, at the last minute I thought, well, I'll take a trip, get a taxi, and go to the theater. Well, I mean, they have to write everything out, and so I handed the driver this note, and apparently he was driving around. I saw my hotel three times as we went around the city. <laughs> and I wound up in the other theater. Oh. And in that theater, they were putting on some show where uh, the um, people were dressed in animal costumes. <laughs> so, you know, they have one, one had the head of, the, of a horse and the other one had the, you know what. Well, I arrived and I was the only Caucasian <laughs> <laughs> in the theater and they looked at me and I thought, I think I'm in the wrong theater. So they were very gracious and called someone and explained and uh, took me around to the other theater. And I was just walking in when the chorus was coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, Loretta, are you going back to the hotel? What are you talking about? I just got here. <laughs> but it, it, was, uh, it was an experience. The first time in my life I could not communicate with anyone. Um, that's, that's, you know, kind of frightening. 
But anyway, I thought I'd pass that on to you because sometimes we find ourselves in situations where communication um, is not that good. <laughs> Especially if you have a, I mean, if I were in Russia, I mean, I would not be able to, well, I could say da, <laughs> and I could say uh, a few words. But actually, I did go to St. Petersburg um, to uh, work with young singers with the Atkins program about three, two or three years ago with Craig Grutenberg. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a delightful time. It's a wonderful program, uh, like the Young Artist Program here at the Met. And uh, wonderful singers. And that was a, my first uh, uh, visit to, to Russia. It was very exciting. The people were wonderful, so friendly and um, accommodating. And it's a great theater, the Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. So I digress. I got off on the subject. I'm sorry. So your name, of course, is Loretta Di Franco. Makes one think that you're Italian-American. Where's your family from in Italy? My father was born in Palermo. And he came here when he was seven with his dad and his, uh, his brother and sister. And my mother was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> and her parents are from, were from Messina. Mm -hmm. So. 100% Sicilian. I think so. Yeah. yeah. And did. I'm proud of it, too. Absolutely. Did you grow up speaking Italian in the home or Siciliano? No, I didn't. I, I you know, unfortunately, they, if they didn't want us to hear what they, we, they were saying, so they spoke in the dialect. And I, you know, I only till later when I was at the Met, I was studying, and I learned Italian with a, a coach who was wonderful. She was Austrian. <laughs> and then I continued, and I went to, uh, I continued with my lessons, but uh, I learned French and German, and of course Italian, and uh, I love languages, so it, it, my desire to learn was uh, ever present, you know, and she was a great teacher. Not only my Italian teacher, but there were other teachers I, I worked with also. Part of what we're going to do tonight that we've never done in the eight years that I've been presenting this at the Casa Italiana Zedili Marimo is we're going to participate in an actual coaching session uh, that you will see in a couple of minutes. Um, I'm giving the artist your five minute warning. Um, <laughs> our soprano tonight, who jumped in at the last minute, and we thank you very much, is Carolina Lopez. Um, Nobuko Amemia is the pianist, and Nobuko was all set to play different music yesterday, and then now we'll be playing completely different music today. And what you're going to see tonight is that Loretta and I will sit in the front row with our microphones. We will turn them off during the singing, but then turn them on, and from the audience, um, Loretta primarily, I secondarily will do some coaching, and you will see how these things work. Um, these are two superb musicians already, so it's not that they're here for anything remedial. They're here for fine-tuning, for suggestions, <laughs> for the experience that someone like Loretta can bring that is unique. This is the Italian language diction coach of the Metropolitan Opera. So we, it's a very privileged thing we're going to experience tonight. That's very tonight. kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so I hope you're in for a new kind of experience tonight. And it'll just take us a couple of minutes to come down to the, from the stage, and then the artist will join you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
So, thank you. I wanted to tell the audience a bit about this opera, La Rondine, because not many people know it in the Puccini canon. Um, he had just written La Fanchula del West for the Metropolitan Opera. It was a huge success. And then the clouds of war of World War I began to arrive. But he was commissioned by the Carl Theater in Vienna to write an operetta. Uh, he said, I want it to be a lot shorter and more fun than De Rosen Cavalier. And he wrote a work that was supposed to appear in Vienna, but then the war began. And instead, it was transferred to Monte Carlo. And it's a story of a woman who's not old, but she's older than the very young characters of opera. And her name is Magda. And there's another character, a tenor named Ruggiero. When I teach this opera, I ask people to think about uh, these two characters as if they were an older version of Rodolfo and Musetta from La Boheme, because those are two survivors in a way, and Ruggiero is a writer, and uh, we can call Magda a party girl who's been to many parties by then, and about their relationship and about what she imagines love to be. And this aria is really about her vision of love. Uh, Doretta being another character, not her, but she explains that lo full love is possible, and that's really what we've just heard. So now I'm going to ask Loretta to take over. Thank you. That was lovely. You have a beautiful voice. <laughs> and, uh, and a very attractive young woman. <coughs> Um, yeah, your phrasing is lovely. Um, I would ask you not to double an R where it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. For instance, you say, Quil bel sogno di Doretta. No, oh. di Doretta, one R. Mm -hmm. um, and pote uh, indovinar. Now, also, it's very important to be aware of open and closed vowels. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hear anything unusual, however, uh, if you can, really pay attention to that distinction of open and closed vowels because um, that's, it, when it's done correctly, it's perfect Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it can tend to sound a bit Americanized. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to say a few words. Actually, would you mind repeating it without music? No. Yeah. yeah. It's conversation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, let it flow. Let the the beauty the beauty of the language flow. Chi il bel sogno di Doretta, il suo mister, come mai, come mai finì? Ahimè un giorno, uno studente in bocca la bacia. 
bacio e fu quel bacio rivelazione fu la passione folle amore folle ebbrezza chi la sottil carezza un bacio così ardente mai ridito mai ridito mai ridito mai ridito potrà ahimè un giorno ahimè eh, ahimè mio, mio sogno mio sogno Um, ai mia vita che importa la ricchezza se al fine rifiorita la felicità o oh, sogno d'or poter amar così um, can you say that fiorita again? fiorita ah, it sounded like a double R no? yes so <laughs> it's only one R I believe Mm-hmm. Fiorita. 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 So look, and also it helps a singer to sing long vowels. Ah, Fiorita. 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 Si. Um, let's go back to... Uh, I, I want to add one thing. I may. There's an accent on the E. I may. I may. Right. So yeah. you can double the M. I may. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, for expression. Mm-hmm. Even though there are uh, quite often there in, in the text it, there's no double consonant, for expression it's quite uh, acceptable to double a consonant. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, as long as it doesn't disturb the flow of the sound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, can you, would you mind repeating that again mm-hmm. from the beginning? Yes. It is on. It is on. Just hold it closer to you. Come mai, come mai finì? Ahimè un giorno, uno, studi- uno studente in tocca well, la bacio. May I stop you for a moment? Yes. yes. Um, ahimè un giorno uno studente, studente. Un, un giorno uno studente. And really uh, let it flow, mm-hmm. tie it together. Mm-hmm. Hold the mic. Can you hear me now? Oh, it's that close, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize. Um, it's important to have fluid diction. Uh, otherwise, it's, it, it, if you overpronounce and it's not uh, fluid and it doesn't flow well easily, it, uh, it sounds choppy. Mm-hmm. So um, this is just in speech, in speaking. When I te- work with singers, I ask them first to, uh, to say the words and as, is in, as in a straight play. And once you're used to speaking the words, and then when you add the music, well, it's another dimension. It's incredible. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure you are aware of that. But I'd, I, I, I stress that because a lot of young American singers, or non-Italian singers, I should say, uh, fall into that, that uh, ex- uh, ex- anxiety to express the diction. It sometimes chops up the flow, the, the legato. So uh, I would suggest that you really, I, it's not a problem with you, but I just wanted to, sp- to uh, mention that. It's very, very important. Well, now I could hear my own voice. I guess I'm holding the microphone. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope I'm making myself understood. Yeah. Um, let's do it one more time, and then I'll, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to sing it again. Before you do, Loretta, could you explain the difference between an open vowel and a closed vowel? Oh, okay, yes. Um, uh, let's see. Che bel sogno, sogno. Di Doretta. Di Doretta. The E in Doretta is actually closed. Di Doretta. If, in other words, if you say Di Doretta, that's open. Okay. And it's not correct. Doretta. Di Doretta. Verso, chi, verso chi. In Italian, the vowels are never totally open or never totally closed. Mm-hmm. But sulla strada, on the way. Okay, <laughs> so when I say something should be a little more closed, not totally, of course, mm-hmm. but um, on the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, open vowels are uh, like the American E-H, E, okay? Closed would be, would be A, but without a diphthong, mm-hmm. okay? Um, does that help you? Yes. 
Now, uh, I may, I may, that E is open at e. the end. I may, I may. Oh, un giorno uno studente in, uh, in bocca la bacio. In bocca la bacio. Those are open. Okay. Uh, e fu quel bacio ri rivelazione fu la passione. Fu la passione. Okay. Um, I don't have to hear the whole, I would like to hear, have you say the folle, folle amore. Mm -hmm. Those are open vowels, O and E. Okay. Folle mm -hmm. brezza. And you must, uh, when there are double consonants, use them. Very important, use the double consonants. E brezza. Si. Chi la sottil carezza un bacio così ardente mai ridir potrà. Let me hear you say that. Chi la sottil carezza. Chi la sottil carezza. Un bacio così ardente mai ridir. Mai ridir. Mai ridir. Potrà. Mai ridir potrà. Oh, oh so now go on. Can you just say, o oh sogno d'or. But, but um, don't go to the ny, the G N too quickly. O sogno d'or. All uh, wonderful. Enjoy the long vowels. O sogno d'or. Poter amar così. Poter amar così. And one T, sweetheart. No, not ah. the. Poter amar, poter amar così. Poter amar così. Don't, and uh, the, the R of amar, you don't have to. It flip it too much, yeah. huh? A little sounds a bit Scottish. We don't want that. Poter amar così. Così, così. A little open, a little open. And I'm just going to add one thing. When we look at a libretto, and we look, let's only talk about Italian here, there are accents. So um, in the second and third, in the third and fourth lines, we have the word bacio, B A C I O, with an accent over the O. And then the next line, bacio. So bacio means I kissed in the past. Bacio means kiss. Mm -hmm. So make a little distinction between bacio and bacio. Bacio. Always being aware of the double consonants and always being aware of long vowels. Yeah. Okay. Now, would you mind yes. singing it again? Thank you.
uh, ju just a few things. Amar has only one M. Yeah, I know. I know. And um, I would s your your phrasing is lovely. Um, don't add double consonants when when it's not required. Okay. I, I think you're doing for expression, but expression uh, is 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 most important, of course. Um, but don't change the, the beautiful words, the language. Uh, also, you are very attractive, and uh, you close your eyes a lot, and you're you're so expressive. I wish you you know. Um, do you feel that? Do Actually, I, I feel the. I agree. You're very attractive. <laughs> that I agree on. But this is a song about a dream, so I don't mind that occasionally you close your eyes because you are channeling the dream of this person in a poem named Doretta. Um, keep your eyes open occasionally, yes, that but would be lovely. because we do want to see them. But in this dramatic moment, I, fee I feel it's okay for you to shut your eyes as you are, ex the song is about a dream, very specifically. Um, I, I appreciate that and I, I agree, uh, but also, there, you, you sang a beautiful long phrase with your eyes closed, and your eyes are so expressive. While it is you're talking, it's a dream, yes, of course, but please open them just a wee bit more, because you're, you have beautiful eyes and, uh, it, and very expressive. And a beautiful voice, your phrasing is lovely, and um, one more thing I might say, if, uh, and I, I don't want to get into technical, uh, technique, but just open your mouth a hair, a few seconds before you actually sing the note. So you give yourself you know, room, okay? Because if, uh, I, I notice a lot of singers begin a phrase just uh, as they were, they're singing. And it's, it's, if you look at the great old timers who sang uh, Leontine Price, uh, Gedda, uh, uh, Luciano, they, they open their mouths even before the sound came out. Yeah. So it makes you, um, it, it makes the tone immediate, you know, and it's ever present. And that's uh, because I think if you open the mouth just as you're about to sing, it, it's not, it, it's not prepared. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? And, and, yeah, and also uh, when you have a good phrase and you want to really make it swell and blossom, it's important to breathe a little earlier. Okay, yeah, a calm breath whenever. Okay, thank you so much. That's lovely. Thank you. Lovely. And so that was the antipasto before the main course. Um, <laughs> now we are going to hear the famous Shena from the first act of La Traviata. Violetta has had an offer of love from Alfredo, and she likes him. Perhaps he's the one, she says. And, but maybe it's just crazy. Maybe I should live the life that I've always led. I always want to be sempre libera. I want to be free. And it's one of the great scenes in all of opera. And we're going to hear it's sung right now. If you like water, yeah, absolutely.
Say one thing before Loretta speaks. I want to remind the audience that these artists jumped in at the last minute with no rehearsal. So that was pretty fabulous. Thank both of you. That was pretty fabulous. Bravissima. Beautiful, darling. Um, this is a tour de force. This, this aria is exceptionally... Um, thrilling and difficult, and you soared the high notes beautifully. I would say, um, first off, the cadences have to be really f slightly fine-tuned. Mm? Yeah. They're, they, yeah, and coming down a scale is more, more of a difficulty than going up, but it, that's, that's the problem. Um, also, yes, and actually, uh, today, one doesn't normally sing the um, E-flat at the end. Yeah, yeah, so. No, 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 no. Oh. Well, most of I like it. it. It's great, <laughs> you know. It's wonderful, but, you know, after seeing so many uh, high notes and cadenzas, and, and it's, it's really, uh, it's really, it, it's usually up to the conductor, but most times I, I've, I haven't heard it in many, in lo quite a long time. Wow, okay. So I think you can <laughs> take it easy there. Unless, <laughs> unless uh, you know, it's. If you wish and the conductor's uh, agreeable, fine. Yeah. But you have to have, you know, really fine-tuned for that. It's um, because, you know, it's, the aria itself is a mouthful, yeah. so to say the least. Let's go back to the very beginning. I won't have you do the whole thing again, yeah. but yeah. Uh, that would be too cruel. I mean, <laughs> it's... Um, uh, I'm actually how much we can work together. <laughs> I'm 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 very happy to work with you. You have a beautiful voice and you're and you're very musical and um, I've lost my place. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Estrano. I don't hear. I didn't hear the first e. Eh. I didn't hear yeah. the first note. It's a little too short. Um, Estrano. Estrano. In cuore scolpito quegli accenti. May I hear that again, please? In cuore scolpito quegli accenti. Um, uh, but let me hear estrano. 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 In core scolpito quegli accenti. In core. Core is a little more open. Oh. Yeah. Oh. In core scolpito quegli accenti. Scolpitio. Scolpitio. Quegli accenti. Quegli accenti. Saria per me sventura. Saria per me sventura. Un serio amore. Un serio amore. Don't be careful not to, m to give me a double M. Hmm? No. Okay. Un serio, serio. Un serio amore. Uh, now go on, please. Che risolvi o turbata anima mia. Uh, non as, huh? Let me get, it's, if you can say. Che yeah. risolvi o turbata anima mia. Che risolvi o turbata anima mia. 
Um, yeah, don't, don't, yeah. don't pronounce it de so much. Nul uomo ancora t'accendeva. Nul uomo ancora t'accendeva. O gioia. And there you can say a double G. O gioia. Yes, exactly. O gioia. Go on, please. O gioia. Chi io non conobbi. Chi io non conobbi. And you. Chi io non conobbi. Yeah, enjoy the double Bs. Chi io non conobbi. E sera amata amando. That, you know, essere amata, es long vowels, essere amata, amando, amando, yeah, okay, go on, e sdegnarla posio, sdegnarla posio, sì, go ahead, please. Per l'aride, per l'aride follie. Per l'aride follie, per l'aride follie del viver mio. Del viver mio. Del viver mio. Yeah, if you were just saying it as a straight play, it would be very touching and, can you hear me? I'm sorry. It would be very touching and moving if you really did it as a dramatic piece, straight, without thinking of the music. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, that I mean, the and it's it's like this. This first bit is like the beginning, the caron of the caronome, where the first uh, words, the first phrases, are so important. Yeah. Maybe more so than the aria itself, and because you establish what you want to say, you establish yeah. everything in this beginning. I think I, I needed more time for the first page than for absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, uh, Fred, did you want to say something? I want to add a couple of things. Understood that you did not rehearse, so that you sort of went right into this. When I teach the sorry, I ask the singer to think of it as an internal monologue, not just a monologue, okay. but you're speaking to yourself. You're reflecting. <coughs> Suddenly, all of these options have come to you in terms of a new romance, or do I want my own life? you can take parts of it slower. A strano. Little beat. A strano. Because you're sort of realizing the dawning is coming to you about what is going on. There were two spots in there that I would have you do just a little more emphasized. O turbata anima mia. You, you ran through that, and it's really, you're thinking of your your troubled soul, yeah. my troubled soul. And then the other one is que yo non conobbi. There's a comma there, and a comma may not seem important, but it is, because you are, you're saying, this is a joy that I've never known. Mm. And then you're saying, well, what is the joy? To be loved so much while I love someone else. To be loved while, while loving. Yes. yes. Um, essere amata amando. And Loretta was completely correct about the the embellishing, let's call it, of those vowels, because you are, you, Violetta, are realizing all of these things all of a sudden that you've never experienced before in your young life. And so you can really treat this as an internal model. Like you're not mm -hmm. speaking to the audience, you're not speaking to anyone around, you're alone on the stage and you're talking to yourself. And you, as a young woman, are suddenly realizing adult things that you had never understood before. And so I, I think that maybe you want to take that. If you want to sing that first part again. Oh, I want to hear it again. Yes. yes. It's, it's very, uh, you have to internalize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, you're expressing your innermost thoughts. And uh, it's extremely uh, important that you um, while it is internal, you still have to express it. But it has to be, um, how can I say it? It has to be moving, touching, and getting in, uh, into your inner self. Um, I, yeah, let me hear it again, please. And take your time, to, you know, even though there are eighth notes and sixteenth notes, no, uh, I, I'd rather hear the actress. 
Okay, use the words, my dear. Yeah. The words are most important. May I, may I interrupt? Yeah. The first part, the first, uh, they're both different, okay? The second one may be a little more intense. Mm -hmm. Would you say that? Yeah. So I would... Estrano, estrano. It's, it's getting in touch with your inner emotions that you know, you're, you've, you're now discovering. Mm -hmm. For the first time, you feel some love that you really didn't feel before. It was all, it was nothing. But this is touching your innermost soul. Okay. So I w we, the audience should hear that in the very, very beginning. Excuse me for interrupting you, darling. I think you're singing a wrong note in there. Che sol vio turba. The tur is a, is. As I, have, I don't have my glasses on, but that's a C. Che sol vio turbata. And you. while we have you, turbata anima mia, you're bridging the two A's from turbata to anima. Try to separate them and just see how that feels. Yes. 
phrase was lovely. Going back, though. Yeah. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Do l'uomo ancora t'accendeva. L'uomo ancora t'accendeva. Ancora. L'uomo ancora t'accendeva. Oh gioia, oh gioia, it should be coming from, you know, oh, in gioia. Is it necessary for you to sing? Oh, can can you hear me now? I'm not <laughs> Is it necessary for you to sing? No. no. If you do two portamenti, one up and one down, it's it's not. Uh, it's too much. It's too much. No, and um, and it's cleaner if you just. Yeah, I, because I think the next time you are bringing, you are making a portamento. I'm not quite sure, but let's, if you don't mind.
you have to clean up the cadenza yeah. pitches. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, the cadenzas, yeah. darling. Um, and one, uh, you say the word. Let's see. Uh, uh, misterioso, misterioso altero. Yeah. When you say altero, the first time you say it open, the second time you say it closed. It's, um, um, let's see, it starts, uh, actually, oh, oh, no, it's not, excuse me, ascese, that's it, the word ascese, I beg your pardon. Lui che modesto è vigile, allegre soli ascese. And then there's next, you have one time it's over, I think the first time you said it was open, and the next time closed. Okay. It is, they're both closed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you really sing so love, it's so beautiful what you're doing. I'm nitpicking, but you know, to be a great artist, yeah. you know, you want to be above the rest. Yeah. And uh, you have this ability. You, you're a very attractive young woman, beautiful voice, but you watch the pictures, it's extreme, yeah. especially in the cadenzas, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Um, uh, and there's suoi colori occulti, there's suoi colori occulti. Lui, can you do, go from Lui che modesto e vigile? I'm not going to have you repeat everything, but there, there are some things that stick out. Yes. Okay. And it's uh, not just the pronunciation. Uh, it's only in a few places. But um, in the cadenzas, if you're not totally fine-tuned, yeah. it, it could uh, really affect the performance. Compliments to the accompanist, also lovely. You have a very, you have a very beautiful voice, and um, I see a very fine future for you. Um, just. Be careful, um, as I said, about open and closed vowels. Mm -hmm. Not too open and not too closed. Mai in Italiano. Also, clean up the cadenzas. Yeah. Now, it's not, and there are a few moments, even in the uh, phrases, you were slightly under. Be careful, you know. Um, yeah, it's the support, my dear, support. <laughs> that, uh, prepare the breath, breathe a, a, a half a measure before you sing, yeah. if you can. And so that sets you up for the, just being totally in tune and right in the core of the sound. Uh, but bravissima, excellent work. Yeah. Thank so.
I agree. Um, I just wanted to formally thank both Carolina Lopez and Nabucco Amemia because they did <laughs> wonderful work in a, in minute. It just it happened this afternoon. So I'm very, very grateful to both of you for your excellent work. And uh, you'll take the places here, and Loretta and I will come back to the stage. Thank you so very much. For the last part of the program, what I'd like to do is take brief, concise questions from the audience for Loretta, very specifically about how to teach and transmit this heritage, <laughs> this legacy that goes back more than 400 years, but is really um, something that is real today. It, it happens every time in every new individual that we work with, and uh, Loretta is a master at that. Oh. So are there questions? Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Fred, Back there. Fred, una domanda. Very brief and very technical. Uh, you, you teach Italian diction to artists from all over the world. Yes, yes I do. Do you have secret or hints that you give based on their native language in order to get rid of any accent that they might have under the Italian? And can you reveal some of them to us? Well, I always start out with the phrases uh, as a straight play, always. That's important to me because the text is so important. Um, of course, the music too, but for me, the text is comes first. Now, uh, we at the Met, we work with we have a lot of Russian singers, and uh, many of them are come here very well prepared. And then there are some because of the language. The, for instance, the L is the Russian L is very far back in the throat, and we have to I have to keep trying to explain how to bring the Italian L more forward. Traidenti, right between the teeth. And uh, some of them get it and some of them don't. And we just have to keep pursuing that. I keep repeating that. And uh, eventually they do. I've had the pleasure of working with Anna Natrepko and um, uh, Atonenko and um, Dimitri Rostovsky, a great, great, great basso. And, um, they're wonderful, and and Anna has really um, improved a lot. She has. Yeah. She has, and um, Dimitri is, was fantastic from the word go. Dimitri he was with us here on the stage a few years it? ago. Oh, he yeah. was. Yeah. What a great loss to us, yeah. to us all. A great, great singer and a wonderful colleague, as they all were, mm -hmm. and um, and still are, but. That's one thing about it. And if you come, um, we have a lot of people coming from um, Czechoslovakia and, uh, um, and countries where you, you wouldn't expect them, and Romania, and where the Italian is not necessarily their language. But a lot of them are well prepared and well uh, schooled, and um, and eager to learn. So I don't know as far as secrets, but. The 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 one thing I I keep express uh, pressing upon is long vowels, double consonants when needed. Please don't add any more than necessary. Okay, <laughs> but um, and watch the R's because it's important to finish a word that ends in an R, like alor, but don't say alor. <laughs> it's another language. It's not Italian, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, sometimes um, <coughs> the double consonant gets lost, especially in a theater like the Met, where almost 4,000 seats. If you don't express the double consonants, it just goes by, and it's, it's not um, a beautiful Italian. The, the Italian language is so beautiful and so uh, great for singers. I mean, Italians actually, <laughs> if you go to Italy, Italians don't have to sing, they speak. They're already the singing. They're set up in the masks. The, the, the language is, you know, is perfect to sing in. And um, if you speak the language well, uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, magnificent. If it's not done well, it's less magnificent. Estr <laughs> <laughs> estrano, um, estrano. 
Sempre yeah. Libera. That that. Oh stuff. my. Um, I'm going to refer you to an article. All of you watching and listening. Uh, I write for WQXR, so you Google Fred Plotkin Opera, and then look up Gigliola Frazzoni. I'll just give you the last name: <laughs> F R A Z Z O N I. Um, I studied with her in Bologna when I was at university there, and she gave the best explanation ever about using the letter R, and also in Italian. And I also want you to read the comments in the article because a coach from Salzburg wrote in about using the R. It's a fascinating thing, this letter R in Italian. So for those of you who really want to learn to use it <laughs> properly in singing, apart from studying with Loretta, you may want to read this article. That gentleman had a question there. The question was, for someone whose first language is Spanish, what is the most difficult thing about speaking or singing in Italian? The gentleman says the R may be one of them. Well, <clears throat> the Spanish language is quite similar to Italian. <clears throat> Some of the, the, the endings may change. The, endings of the ending of a word may change from a Spanish to Italian. Um, but... And the use of the R is very, very important because if a word is, has an R in the middle that is not doubled, okay, a singular R, it's one flip. I, how else can I explain the flip? It's a R instead of R, you know, sounding Scottish, but nothing against the Scottish language, but it's not Italian if you double it, okay, if you double it too much. Uh, as far as Spanish, I've sung in Spanish, and... Um, I found it just very similar to Italian, long vowels, for one thing. Um, the E's can be slightly different. The E vowel in Spanish may be slightly different than in Italian. Um, of course, it depends upon the word. Um, give me an example uh, of an Italian word, of a Spanish word that seems to you seems different from Italian. Not the canai at the moment. <laughs> you, oh, me. It seems to have something to do with the cadence and the flow and the tenor. Well, uh, it's hard to put my finger on it. Well, <coughs> you're right. It's the, it's the flow of the language. Um, uh, I can't think of a phrase in Spanish at the moment that I've sung. Uh, but in Italian, as always, long vowels, double consonants when when needed, don't add double consonants, like for instance, when you said amore, as an expression, uh, you don't double the M, you say amore, but you, it's, it's, a, it's a physical thing too. Um, and in your face, your face in Italian shows everything, you know, and as in Spanish, but uh, in, I don't think if I can remember this, the long the vowels in, in the Spanish are as long as in Italian. I might be mistaken. I it? agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's that's about what I can say in, in as far as Spanish is concerned, similar to Italian. The only th the thing that's different uh, would be the endings, and um, mm -hmm. and some of the vowels. Many Spanish words don't end in vowels, whereas most Italian words do end in vowels. Yes, uh, and and most of the uh, excuse me, uh, most of the e's that uh, words that end in e are slightly closed. Okay, verso chiuso or sulla strada, I like to say. Okay. Oh well, there's no J actually in Italian. No. So right. that takes care of that problem. <laughs> the only J in Italian is Joker. <laughs> Seriously. So down here we have a question. This gentleman is a bass. He's a young singer. Oh, and welcome. so we're going to get you a microphone. Not that you need, but we're going to get you a microphone. Good evening. Uh, thank Good you evening. all for this wonderful evening. Uh, as a singer, I had a, yeah, a relatively technical question. Um, you can answer this in your experience as a singer or as a coach, but 
Italian opera is distinguished because it or is distinguished by the fact of that there are a lot of operas with recitative, and so I'm curious as to how uh, what would you say is the quintessential difference for you when you're coaching someone on recitative, the dialogue versus an aria. I'm glad you asked that question. It's a great question, and a lot of young singers, um, older ones too, uh, don't uh, r remember or are unaware that it is conversation accompanied by a few notes here and there, but mostly conversation. And for me, all the action takes place in the recit. Um, so <clears throat> we must remember that when you're doing a, re a recit, speak it first. Without music, especially the recits, because that's, that's conversation. And, um, you see, now I can't even talk without using my hands, but... <laughs> um, um, as a, and as long as you understand exactly what you're saying, the words are extremely important. And they become very personal, depending on where you are in the opera. Do, do you sing, for instance, Leporello? OK, you sing Leporello? And Don Giovanni? Have you ever? Uh, both. Uh, so now you're totally confused, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 but um, in Leporello's aria, um, Madamina. Madamina, see. Um, it begins, uh, if I recall, somewhat conversational. And then it develops into some more broader singing. But um, that's, is, that's something you, you, you learn and only by speaking, speaking the language without the music. Um, for instance, when you've sung, you've sung Don Giovanni, oh, you have lots of dialogue. Also Leporello, but Don Giovanni, um, it's very, very um, important to know exactly what you're saying. Well, in anything it is, but especially with Don Giovanni because he's such a, a, a varied character. He has many colors. Um, so, and, and most of them not very, rather dark. <laughs> but he has many colors, so in your expression, make it, make it personal. I keep saying that because it's very important that your words come from within, from your heart, from your mind and your heart. You know, uh, it has to be, you have to be intelligent to know how you want to express a phrase. And it, it becomes part of you. I hope I'm making myself understood. It has to come from deep within you. Uh, and once you know what you're saying, you can vary it from one performance to the next. Uh, you, I mean, not every performance is exactly alike. We know that. Especially with recits, you, you express something, or something could happen unexpectedly, and you're, whoops, you're in a different uh, mode. You're, you know, you're, not that one is, can, no one is uh, deterred from their thought, but um, it's so important to uh, be able to express yourself without the music. You know, it's extremely important. I hope that explains something to you, because we must remember, all singers should remember, that it's conversation. Everything important happens in the recit. And then the music is just an, a, a development of that expression. Um, does that help you? And I'm going to add a couple of things. Um, let's look at the language. Recitativo comes from the Italian recitare, which means to act. It doesn't mean to recite. It does that too, but it really means acting. And therefore, you are inhabiting your character with the recitativa. We in the audience learn more about the character in the recitativo than perhaps we do in the music. So Absolutely, yes. whether we are fluent in Italian or not, you, the singer, you, the singer, have to be <coughs> fluent and knowledgeable of every subtlety in those words, um, especially in Da Ponte's music, 
or words uh, for Mozart's music. Mozart fully understood the implications, the contradictions, the duplicity, the sfumature, which means the sort of uh, cloudiness, the shadiness, the colorings in mm -hmm. the language. And Mozart's genius was to express all of that, but da Ponte already was a magnificent dramatist, and he could get comedy and tragedy in one phrase. So all that is there, so you need to own that, to use a verb Loretta used before, but then get rid of your ownership and just live it. Exactly. So it is acting, fully acting, when you're doing a recitativo. I can fall asleep in the middle of a recit <laughs> when I hear people who are doing it by rote, and they really don't know what they're saying. They're just and they don't to say get anything. They don't say anything. It's just <laughs> And then they sing. That's terrible. But then let me pick a few people. Luca Pizzeroni. Oh, he's wonderful. Bryn Turville really know how to do recitativo. And since that's your voice category, I would recommend you listen to those two. Pizzeroni being a native Italian speaker, Bryn Turville <laughs> not. But somehow both of them really give so much punch and meaning to the sfumature of the language. In other words, you have to digest the words. It has to come from within you. And it has to, you, you express your own personality in what you're saying, tying that to what, the word, what you are saying, of course. But a lot of it comes from your mind and your, your heart and your knowledge of, uh, how, of, of acting. Acting, it's. It seems when it's done well, it seems like it's very simple. And you uh, and the audience, even though they might not know the language, they they know your expression, they know your intention, and that's very very important. When I was in Saint Petersburg, I was walk, working with this young, uh, young uh, bass baritone. He was working on uh, Don Giovanni, and he, he just didn't get it the the flavor of the Italian. I said, you know. Do you know the words? Oh, yes. Yeah. Can you sing it in Russian? And he did. And all of a sudden, the whole world opened up. And he knew what he was saying. He was expressive. Ah, so you see? It's the same thing in Italian, only the language is different. You're feeling something that's very uh, and expressive and very important. To, so the language is extremely important. When he sang in his native language, it was wonderful. And... Um, but then, you know, you have to know the nuances of the language you're singing in. And very, very important, especially in recits. I mean, the, in the rest of the arias, everyone, most people uh, have heard the arias over and over again. But the recits explain everything. All the action for me takes place in the recit. I hope that helps you. Yeah. We have time for one last question. There was someone in the back, I think. Back there. Wait, Hi. wait for your microphone. That's we a soprano. No, no, I don't need a mic. Oh, okay. No, you do because we're <laughs> yes, you do. Hello. We're recording. We oh. do need a. Okay. Yeah. What is your favorite opera? Oh wow, my favorite opera. That's a very difficult question to answer. I would normally would say it's the opera I'm singing in. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've sung Mimi and Musetta, and uh, I love Mimi. Musetta is a very difficult role. It's uh, not as easy as one would think. It's um, really boring on a full lyric spinto, especially at the Met. Mm -hmm. And uh, because when you're singing in a, in a larger house, you have to give more. I don't mean pushing, but you, have, have, you must have more presence in the sound. And um, very important. So when we have a Mimi, uh, rather a Musetta at the Met, it's usually a, a larger voice. And uh, that's just one my own opinion, but um, uh, getting back to your question, it's hard for me to say what my favorite opera would be. It would, it, I've sung Gilda, I've sung Lucia, and um, Figaro and Susanna. Well, Susanna and Figaro is, is really high up there. I love that role. You're never off stage, you're always on stage. <laughs> and uh, it's a great opera, it's a jewel. Um, I can only say that the opera I would be involved in would be my favorite at the t at the moment, and um, because you know when you sing opera, 
you inv you're so invested in what you're saying, in the words and um, phrasing. And it takes a lot out of you because you're expressing to an audience your innermost feelings according to the words in the, in the text. But you're expressing your soul. And that's very um, personal. And a lot of singers, I hope I'm making myself understood about that, because for me that's extremely important to know the words, to digest them, to make it a part of oneself. Very, very important. How can the audience feel anything if you don't you know, immerse yourself in the text and be able to express that? Express that with, with meaning and intention, not just facade, not just to, to gloss over and say, say a text, no. It has to become a part of you. And w if it is, the audience senses it extremely senses and and um, I mean you could express with your eyes with your body with your <laughs> hands as I do but um, it's very very important to absorb the language make it a part of you especially with recits but in everything but it's even more obvious with recits um, as uh, in Karonome the first few phrases of Karonome I mean, are worth the whole aria. <laughs> you know, it's so important, as in uh, Estrano, as in Violetas. The text is everything. When enjoy I the text. Enjoy the words, enjoy the beautiful language, enjoy the words, because uh, they're so expressive. And Taponte, as you said, is a, is a master. And so was Verdi, of course, and Puccini, and Wagner, right? Who wrote his own words <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and needed an editor. So our wonderful pianist tonight, Nobuko, is from Japan. And she knows that in Japan they venerate their artists. Oh, yes. And they have what are known as living national treasures. And in my work with some Japanese artists, I've been able to work with four Japanese living national treasures in my career. And I'm very thrilled tonight that I was able to work with an American living national treasure. Would you please thank Loretta de Franco? Oh my, well thank you. Thank you. Thank you for it. That's so sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you.